Well, I'm Pastor Kevin. Good morning, and i uh, so glad that you are here. We've been praying for you. Welcome to all of you worshiping with us online, both uh, whether you're in the city, in the region, or around the world. We know we got a lot of people from India that uh, tune in often and worship with us, so welcome to you. We Two weeks ago, we started a series called Identity Theft, and then I, I preached that series so I could preach the, 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 the preach that sermon so I could preach the sermon today. It was kind of foundation. I remember you were here, I preached on the blood of Jesus. We sang all the songs about the blood. And so we, we got that foundation laid and we talked about uh, who do you think you are? I mean, that's important. And we talked about you got to think you are who God says you are and not who the world says you were, but it's who he says you are. You got to have your identity in Christ. I mean, you can't go anywhere without your ID. I mean, you can go places, but you can't cash a check. And they go, could I see your ID? I mean, if you want your money, you got to have your ID, right? If you want what God has provided for you, you have to know who you are in Christ. You have to produce your ID. Uh, you know, if you're going to drive, you get pulled over, what's the first thing they ask for? I need your license and registry. I need your license. you got to see your ID, right? So we're talking about your identity being found not in your family lineage, not in your past, uh, but in who Christ says you are and in his redemptive work. So uh, we want you to go somewhere. So we got to get you ID. Now, one of the sticky phrases from two weeks ago, and I say two weeks ago because last Sunday, Mike was here from India. Uh, he's our boots on the ground in India, our missionary. And oh, this I know, uh, just to tag back into the offering, um, just to brag on you guys, uh, Mike and Jyoti, our missionaries, boots on the ground in India, they got, we, got, we put them on the plane with 11500 extra dollars in their pocket. So thank you for that, your generosity. You guys blow me away. People say, man, your church ain't that big. How come y'all give so much? I'm like, Man, I don't know, but I'm not going to, if it ain't broke, you know what I'm saying? So thank you. Keep up the good work. So 6000 of that totally funded all of Christmas in India for the 122 children that we support over there. So they're going to have the best Christmas of their entire little lives. And then um, 5000 of that was for, um, uh, for the Bible school in India that started this week. 43 nation shakers in training. New church planners are coming to our Bible school campus that you've been helping us build. That started this week, and then we just put some extra in there just for them to enjoy and, and to have a nice ride home. So thank you for being so generous. That's incredible. You guys did a good job. All right, last week we said the life that Jesus lived, it qualified him for the death that he died. And the death that Jesus died qualifies you for the life that he lived. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Did you get all that? The life that he lived qualified him for the death that he died. The death that he died qualifies you for the life that he lived. In other, word, in other words, you can live like Jesus lived. Now, I know it's going to stretch our thinking a little bit today, but we got to know who Jesus is because he is uh, our pattern. He's our pattern. So we know he's our Savior. Can you say amen? amen. We know he was our substitute, our Redeemer. We know he's the conqueror of death, hell, and the grave. We know that he's our deliverer, our intercessor, our advocate. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's our king. He's our Lord. He is the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, the bright and morning star. We know that he was Noah's ark. He was the fourth man in the fire. He's all, he's the ram caught in a thicket. How I many know if you are in a jam, he will be your ram, amen? I mean, we know Jesus is all through the scriptures. He's the scarlet thread of redemption that runs through the entire Bible. But one thing you have to know, in addition to all that, is that he's not just your savior, he's your pattern. He's your pattern. Why is that important? Because you've got to stop identifying with the weakness and start identifying with the strength. He is the strength of our life. Yeah, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, you were a sinner, but if grace saved you, you're not a sinner anymore. Now you're a son and a daughter. See the difference? You are a son of God. Now you're not the son of God. 
but he's our pattern, so you're like him. You look like Jesus. Now, how many are excited school starting back? Four of you? How many of you feel guilty because you're so excited that your kids are going back to school? You're like, oh, man, praise God. If, I shouldn't be this excited. Okay. I know, I know. All right. But we're talking about patterns. Keep church as a part of your pattern, of a, as a part of your routine. And because we're talking about patterns today. In school, at some point this year, they're going to talk to your kids about patterns. Uh, how many of you liked math when you were in school? I liked math. How many of you did not like math when you were in school? Well, quick math, that's about 70-30 there. So, <laughs> Well, um, they're going to talk about patterns. You know, uh, the fastest road car in the world is a Bugatti Sport 300 plus. It will travel three, it will go 300 miles an hour, over 300 miles an hour. <laughs> I don't know where you can drive a car that fast. I guess the... The, the Autobahn, maybe. But as a cool-looking car as that is, if it didn't have any gas in it, okay. it wouldn't go anywhere, would it? So you can have, um, let me say it to you this way, resolutions without routines are like Bugattis without fuel. Let me say it to you a different way. You can't change, you, resolve can't change what routine created. You have to change the routine, and that's what you use your resolve for. Does that make sense? Or determination alone can't change what decisions created. Does that make sense? In other words, you can't believe your way out of problems that you behaved your way into. You have to change the pattern, right? Now, in school, I'm going to give you a pattern. If you don't like the product or the answer, you change the pattern. So 111 times 6 equals 666. Now, I don't like that. So if I want to change it, i got to change up the pattern, right? So I'm going to change it to 111 times 7 equals 777. Different product, different pattern. So if you want your life to have a different product, you got to change the pattern. Now, God knew this because Adam was our pattern. In Adam, all die. So God's like, I don't like that answer. I'm going to change the pattern. So he sent a second Adam named Yeshua, named Jesus. He changed our pattern, Tanya. That way you can get a totally different answer. When God looks at you, he doesn't see sinner, he sees son in Christ Jesus. All right, so I'm going to read a verse to you. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 says, Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become our first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Why is he first? Because he's not the last. There's other fruit like him. Look at your neighbor and say, you look fruity. <laughs> verse 21 for since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die even so in Christ all shall be made alive new pattern so here's the sermon in a sentence today Jesus became like us in the death that he died so that we can become like him in the life that he lived. We say it again. Jesus became like us in the death that he died so that we could become like him. Uh, did I say that wrong? Jesus became like us in the death that he died so that we could become like him in the life that he lived. Change the pattern. So here, here's, here's what we're going to say from now on. We say, we identify with your power, God. Not, not with our weakness, but with his power. Not human weakness, but with divine strength. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We identify with Jesus' victories. How many know he was victorious over sin, sickness, self, Satan, hell itself, the grave? 
He's the eternally victorious one. We identify with that, not with the defeat. Oh, oh, I'm just struggling through this life. I get it, but we're going to identify. You know, the whole world right now is talking about how do you identify. But let me tell you how I identify. I identify as Christ. I am a Christ man. You might even call me a Christian because that's what it means. They were first called Christians at the church in Antioch. And that, that's our role model church, by the way, in Antioch. That's where, you know, it says in Acts chapter 13, now there were in the church in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, and it names five of them, and the last one was Saul or Paul. And so uh, this was a church that was run by the fivefold ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I heard a guy on uh, YouTube or somewhere that day, he goes, I believe in the three offices. I'm like, three offices? He said, I believe in the pastor and the teacher and the evangelist. I'm like... Well, who is he to change the eternal word of God? There's five of them in there, but he only believes in three of them. Anyway, that was a side note. But anyway, I don't know they're still apostles. They're still prophets. They're still evangelists, pastors, and teachers, yes. If there were, there are, because he's not the great I was. He's the great I am. All right, and so nonetheless, that church was awesome, and it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had finished ministering to the Lord, they prayed over those boys. They laid hands on them and they sent them out. I like that church because they were like this church, a sending church. Sending their best out to the nations of the earth and into the community. They were always, they were sent, they were givers and prayers and senders. They were a powerful church. And it was from that power base, that church, that they changed the world. That's why we know the gospel today because of that church. That's awesome. So we, are, we want to be an Antioch church, a church that operates in the power of God, but we also aren't afraid. We don't hold everybody. We send people. Send us out. Oh, man. We're a sending base, a sending church. In fact, I got a new vision. We're not just a local church. We're a church planting church. Amen? In fact, in, a, in a 2025, we're starting a Bible school here because the Lord spoke to me, and he said, um, now, years ago, uh, a big mega church tried to, to hire me uh, away from here. And, uh, and I have to be honest, I was excited. I told them yes. I said, now I got to pray about it. But yeah, this was like, you know, 15, 16 years ago. They said, we want, it was like 20,000 member church. They wanted me to come be their young adults guy. You know, I'm like, yes. I said, let me pray about it. But yes, that sounds great. They said, we'll, we'll give you a raise in your salary and we'll, uh, we'll let you go to India and we'll give you benefits. I'm like, cool, what are those? <laughs> Yeah, that all sounds great. So I prayed about it, and God didn't say nothing. Second day, I prayed nothing. Third day, I started yelling at God. You ever yelled at God? I said, you said call unto me, and I'll answer you. I've been calling you for three days, and you ain't answered me yet. And the Lord kindly spoke to me, and he said, what's the last thing I told you to do? Well, Lord, you said keep the work in India going, and you said pastor the church in Mobile. He said, if I change my mind, you'll be the first person that I tell. <laughs> then he said this, don't bring this up to me again about going anywhere else, doing anything different until you've pastored that church for 20 years. Now, I was five years in, and I said, 20 years? That sounded like a jail sentence. 20 years? But how many know 20 years flew by? And now we're in 21. And I was afraid to bring it up to the Lord. He said, don't bring it up. It's been 20 years. Man, should I bring it up? Should I not bring it up? Well, he brought it up. He said, this is what I want you to do now. I want you to do here what you do there. I want you to do on the Gulf Coast what you do in India. I'm like, hey, I like that. Sounds fun. What do we do in India? It's simple. We train laborers and leaders, and we plant churches. That's what we do. So we're starting a Bible school in 2025 to train laborers. It's not a Bible college. It's a Bible training center. It's not a university. You can't get a degree. I mean, we might get it accredited or something one day, but we'll, we'll give you a degree. And we're going to give you a degree in how to kick the devil's butt and how to plant churches. Amen. 
And so I'm excited about that. I don't know what tuition is going to cost, but it's going to be awesome. In fact, uh, Jump Kids will be moving out of their room into the Rock Dock here in the next couple of weeks. We got that room like 99% done. And then we're going to start renovating that room and turn it into the young adults room, our youth room, and our Bible college room, Bible training center room. And so uh, we're going to need about a quarter million dollars for that. So if you want to write a check, uh, make it out to Harvest Church, and we'll name it after you. And if you want to pay off the building, that's only 850000 so a million ought to take care of everything today. So if you're writing, making a check on M-I-L-L-I-O-N. Okay. So um, Jesus is our pattern. And here's what we want to know today is that I accept the way that he lived is the way that I can live on earth. Can I say that one more time? I want you to accept that the way he lived is the way that you can live here on the earth the way that he flowed in the power of the spirit you can flow in the power of the spirit the way that he never sinned you can never sin wait a minute now preacher bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god that's right we know you have sinned i have sinned but you don't have to continue in your sin that's why he came now let me say it to you this way uh you could be humming along and think, you know what? It's been 90 days or so. I hadn't cussed or cheated or I hadn't lied. Man, all of a sudden you start feeling good about yourself and you go, oh no, I'm in pride. So I mean, anyway. But my point is, is that we are free because of Jesus' work. We're free from the penalty of sin. Can you say thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. We're free from the power of sin. It doesn't have to have power over you. Can you say thank you, Lord? And one day when Jesus comes and he establishes his kingdom here on the earth, we will then be free from the presence of sin. It won't even be here anymore. Hallelujah. That's going to be good. But in the meantime, two out of three ain't bad. We can live free from the penalty and the power of it. And the presence of it is still here. That's why we wash our feet metaphorically. So how serious are we about becoming like Jesus? Anybody want to be like Jesus? Because he's our pattern. Let's look at Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. One, two, three. We're going to look at four scriptures today, or four more. And the next one is in Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. So if it's not good, God's not done yet, right? All things work together for good for those who love God. Anybody love God? Ooh, some stuff's working together for your good. To those who are called according to his purpose. Are you called according to his purpose? If you didn't know it, you are. If you're a Christ follower, he's called you. He's drawn you out because he's got a plan and a purpose for you. He's called you out to do his will. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So what are you predestined for? To be conformed to the image of his son. Whoa. That's God's plan, is to conform you, to mold you, to make you into the image of his son to where when God sees you, when the devil sees you, when your neighbor sees you, they can't even tell it's you. You look like Jesus. Isn't that awesome? You know, you hear people talk about black Jesus and white Jesus. And in India, they talk about the Indian Jesus. I mean, you know, every culture thinks Jesus looks like them. We know he was from the Middle East, so he was dark-skinned, olive-skinned. He wasn't blue-eyed Jesus. But I want you to know today, you could be so conformed to the image of Jesus that not only in the spirit, but wherever you go in this community, people look at that, they see Anna, they go, oh, that's Colombian Jesus. They look at Auntie Miriam and they go, oh, there's beautiful black lady Jesus. Amen? Amen. Come on, when they see you, they see, they see little short Nana Jesus. <laughs> I'm telling you, I got a little Jesus sitting right by my coffee pot. How many, everybody, know, everybody needs a little coffee and a little Jesus. <laughs> and so when they see you coming, they see Jesus coming. Because you can live like him. You've been predestined to be conformed to his image. I know I'm using a little humor this morning, but, but, but this is the way he's called us to live because he is our pattern. He's our pattern. So those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son that we, that he rather, he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Why is he the first? Because he's not the last. You came along. 
Verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. Wow. What then shall we say to these things? How about you got to say this stuff? You got to talk about this stuff. What, it's important what you say. If we say, if God is for us, doesn't even matter who's against us. Amen. He, God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us what? All things. What things? Whatever things you need to fulfill that purpose he's called you to. Whether it's a jet or whether it's a donkey. We got a, we got a missionary friend down in, um, in South America. And there's tri he, and he, he married one of these beautiful South American women. He's an American guy from Texas. And he married one of them pretty South American girls. And he lives down there. And they go up these mountains to these tribes that have never heard the gospel before. And the only way you can get there is on a donkey. Can't fly in. You got you to get a burra. So we've sent him some money before. And, and So whether you need a jet or a jackass, God will get you what you need to fulfill the purpose that he's called you to fulfill. So how many prosperity is so that you can have all that you need to do everything God's called you to do, whatever it is. If you need it, God says, I got it. And if I don't got it, I'll make it. But he's our pattern. We're predestined to be conformed into his image. Mark chapter 5, Mark 5, 25. Now, this is a great story, and it's important who you identify with in this story. Now, at some point in your life, you may identify with the woman, and that's fine if that's where you are. But then you have to get to the point to where you identify with the man. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. That reminds me of a, sorry, not in my notes, but it reminds me of a story of a few years ago, my wife and I were in Samoa ministering there, and I preached a sermon called Shame on Jesus. And because how many know Jesus bore our sin and our shame? So if anybody ever says, shame on you, ever, when you're a kid, shame, 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 everybody knows your name. We say, no, not shame on me, shame on Jesus. Shame off me, shame on Jesus. He bore my shame because shame is an ugly little monster. It'll eat your lunch if you let it. So this little beautiful Samoan woman came up to us after the message, <clears throat> and she kind of looked around, made sure nobody was listening, and she goes, will you pray for me? My wife and I said, yeah, well, sure, what's going on? She goes, I've been bleeding. Hmm, bleeding? For, for eight months. Now, I'm a dude, so, I, you know, right over my head. I said, man, have you put a Band-Aid on it or something? And, and my wife's like, Kevin, it's not that kind of bleeding. I was like, ooh. And so, uh, like, well, has anybody prayed for you? She goes, yeah, lots of people have prayed for me. And I thought, well, I'm not any more anointed than those people. So, but, I mean, I guess we'll pray. I mean, but then I stopped and I asked a question. This is what I want you to do. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do right now? And when I asked that question, this question came up in my heart. And the, the Holy Spirit said, ask her what happened eight months ago. What happened eight months ago? She kind of looked around and she said, I slept with my boyfriend. She started crying. My wife hugged her. And so we said, you know what? The Bible says that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we just let her in the prayer of getting things restored with God, got her, got her conscience cleansed and got her conscience cleared and, and got her walking in that forgiveness. And we never had to pray for her for healing. She was instantly healed. Shame went away. The healing came. Anyway, that, that story was for free. wasn't in my notes. But there was a certain woman that had a flow of blood for 12 years. And she suffered many things from many physicians. And she had spent all she had and she was no better but rather grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, how many know faith comes by hearing? She came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, it's important what you say, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, who's our pattern, right? Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, he turned around and he said to his disciples, who touched my clothes? 
His disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, gave her a new ID, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Great story. Now, in this story, be careful not to identify with the woman with the issue of blood needing to touch somebody else to access God's power. That's not your pattern for Christian life. Now, if you need that, that's okay. We believe in that. and We lay hands on the sick and all that kind of stuff. But I want you to start transitioning to letting Jesus be your pattern. We should learn to receive by faith, but it's time that we stand up, that we work for and with the Lord, and that we're unstoppable, and we identify with Jesus in this story to where people are touching us and powers flowing out of us into them. So we want to elevate our thinking and remember that the woman with the issue of blood is not our pattern. She showed us how to receive healing, but Jesus is our pattern. He's our role model. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he says, you follow me as I follow Jesus. Paul was a good pattern. Because he was following the pattern. So virtue or power flowed out of Jesus to the woman. Virtue, power flows out of you to everybody that you come in contact with. Can you see that? Can you think on that? Can you get your mind around that? Let that renew your mind. The Lord said to me, Kevin, I expect you to train people like I did 2,000 years ago. And you get the same result with them that I got with the 12 and with the 70 when I sent them out. Well, that's one, another reason we're starting our Bible school. So, remember when Jesus had to grab Peter? He was sinking in the water. Jesus was out there walking on the water. Peter said, hey, if it's you, Lord, bid me come. So Jesus said, come on. Peter jumped out of the boat, started walking on the water, and then he got to looking around, and he started to sink. And Jesus reached down and grabbed him, and he said, uh, what happened to your faith? Or, oh, you have little faith. A little didn't mean his faith was small. It just meant it was short-lived. He's like, hey, the whole time you were in faith, you were walking on the water. But when you stopped believing, you started sinking. So it was more about a duration thing. Sometimes you got to believe long. Anyway, will you identify with Peter, the one who started sinking? Or will you identify with the other human in the story who effortlessly walked on the water? Think about it. Peter's not our pattern. Jesus is. Our pattern is Christ. So as a pastor, if I do my job right, you will hear from God for yourself. You, I want you to have your stories. I want you to have your testimonies. Uh, I want you to come to me and say, hey, remember a couple weeks ago, that precious lady, she was in stage four uh, breast cancer. She brought a doctor's report in. She got healed. There she is right there. Totally healed of cancer. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> you're going to have your stories you're going to have your testimonies pastor I was at Walmart I was at Target Target the Holy Ghost led me to this person or this person to me I prayed for him and God did a miracle and you're going to have your stories that was the Antioch church they all had their stories man why they were all being led by the spirit so the mark of a mature Christian is not seniority. Just I've been doing this a long time. But it's responsibility. We take responsibility for the harvest here in Mobile and on the Gulf Coast. We as a church, we take responsibility for the outpouring of God's Spirit that He wants to give us in this city and in this region. We take responsibility for it. I was at a pastor's meeting earlier this week. And... Um, uh, there was pastors from Methodist, Baptist, uh, Assembly of God. We, we meet, you know, a couple times a month. And um, I hadn't been there in a few weeks, so I decided I wasn't going to say anything. I was going to sit and listen. And the leader of the meeting, he goes, hey, somebody tell us about your summer. You know, what's been going on this summer? And I sat there waiting for somebody to open up. And, and the leader of the meeting goes, Kevin, you went on some neat trips this summer. Uh, tell us about your summer. I was like, oh, man. I, was gonna, I resolved not to say anything. I said, y'all sure you want to hear about my summer? They're like, yeah. I said, well, we went to Samoa and the South Pacific and, and uh, uh, 
a devil was cast out of this girl on the whole island that I never heard the gospel got saved and I stuck my finger in people's ears and their ears open, deaf ears open. It was amazing. Now when I came home, uh, we've had 50 people baptized in the Holy Ghost at our church, 30-something people born again. We baptized 21 people and instead of a summer slump. We've had a summer junk. We've grown like 80 people this summer. It's been amazing. God, whatever you're doing, don't stop. And then nobody else wanted to share about their summer. They wanted to talk, keep talking about, wow, that's amazing. You stuck your finger in somebody. What happened? And the Baptist guy was like, ma'am, you know, who am I? To? God always does what God wants to do. And I'm like, he wants to heal people. It's awesome. And so the whole conversation, we never got to our agenda. We talked about God moving in our city the whole time. How do you get a bunch of pastors from a different, 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 different kinds of churches talking about God moving in a city? We might have God moving in our city. I don't know why I told you all that. But we're taking responsibility. We take responsibility for the outpouring of God's Spirit in our city and on the Gulf Coast. We will not not have an outpouring of God's Spirit. I like what that one old revival, he used to pray. He goes, God, you don't think we're not going to have revival, do you? It's the preacher praying to God. God, he's making sure God was in faith. You're not doubting this, are you, Lord? Because I'm convinced we're going to have a revival. And they did. That was Charles G. Finney. He went to a city in New York to a church that didn't have a pastor and he's to fill in. And over the course of six months, 100,000 people were born again. And this was in the 1800s. The crime rate was so low, the policemen started quartets. Bars turned into Bible studies. People, influential, powerful people humbled themselves and repented of their sin and invited their friends to church. And 100,000 people were born again. Hallelujah. Charles Finney said, God, you don't think we're not going to have revival, do you? So we take responsibility for the revival, for the outpouring of God's Spirit, not just in Mobile, not just in our church, on the Gulf Coast. We're a church planting church, bless God. We're a laborer sending church. We're a missionary sending church. We're bigger on the outside than we are on the inside. It's not about our seating capacity, it's about our sending capacity. We're a launching base to your destiny, to the nations of the world. So we take responsibility for that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We've got two more verses, two more scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5 says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come to you with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of what? Power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul learned this lesson because in the book of Acts, he went to visit the city of Athens, Greece. And that's where all the smart people were, all the philosophers. And so Paul was one of the brightest minds on the planet. And so he got right up in there with them. And that's when we hear Paul saying things like, we never heard him say anywhere else, but he says, you know, in him we live and have our being. In him we live and move and have our being. And to the unknown God. And, and he started quoting poetry and all these things that we never heard Paul do before. And guess what happened in the city of Athens? Nothing. Nobody got saved. Nobody got healed. No miracles happened. So Paul determined I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to get back to preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified and raised from the dead. That's why he said in Romans 1, 16, that the preaching of the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to them that believe. Not trading philosophies, but preaching the Jesus that died for our sin and rose again. And so that's why, he, that's why power operated when he preached. So Paul was operating with the power of God. He said, my speech and my preaching, two operations. So whenever you go somewhere... You're talking, aren't you? Your speech and your preaching, the life that you live, has power flowing through it because Jesus is your pattern. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know everything about everything as long as you know the one who knows everything about everything. Last verse, Acts chapter 14. Acts 14, verse 7. strength in his feet a certain man without strength in his feet was he was sitting he was crippled from his mother's womb whom he had never walked this man heard paul speaking so there's paul speaking with power and we know faith comes by hearing so when people hear you talk faith comes to their hearts amen that's good isn't it 
Hallelujah. So when Ayana talks, faith comes to people's hearts because she's speaking the word of God. Amen. When Jojo talks, faith comes to people's hearts. So when Paul was speaking, all of a sudden something happened. Paul observed this crippled man intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Now, how did Paul see that? He discerned it spiritually. So you have, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of seeing and knowing. In other words, you, he will allow you to know things supernaturally that you otherwise couldn't or wouldn't know unless the Lord showed it to you. It's a cool thing. It's a big advantage. Uh, I walked into a restaurant in Kansas City several years ago, and it was an Outback Steakhouse. Walked in, and the hostess, she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. It's 4 o'clock, and we don't open for dinner until 5, and we had to get somewhere, and we were hungry. We we're like, ah. I said, okay, all right, bummer, oh, well. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit said, ask her if she likes to sing. And I thought, that is so random. <laughs> but, you know, it was so random, I thought it's probably the Lord. And so we turned to walk out, and I stopped, and I turned around, and I said, I got a question for you. Do you like to sing? This young woman burst into tears, and she said, why would you ask me that? I'm like, whoa, what just happened? <laughs> she goes, I love to sing, but I can't because I have these growths on my vocal cords, and they said I'll never sing again. I'm like, ah, oh, that's why the Holy Spirit wanted me to ask you that. I said, oh, well, the Lord wanted me to ask you that because he made you to sing, and anything that's trying to stop you from doing what he made you to do is an enemy, and all the enemies are under his feet. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe he has the power to heal you? She goes, yeah. So we put our hand right there on her little throat, right there on her vocal cords, and we curse those nodules and growths to go away in Jesus' name, and she, she started swallowing. She goes, oh. I feel different. I feel different. I said, because those growths are gone. You are different. I said, sing, baby, sing. God healed her right there in the middle. So anyway, how did I know that? Paul saw this man, and he said, he's got faith to be healed. How did he know that? He knew it by the Holy Ghost. You got to trust your knower. You got the knower on the inside of you. So Paul, observing him intently, seeing that he had faith to be hid, healed, said with a loud voice, <clears throat> stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and he walked. So what did Paul do? He paused in his sermon for a demonstration of power. And the man was healed. Paul knew in his spirit. So he pressed pause. He pressed pause. And that's what we're going to do right now. And that's what I want you to do as a matter of uh, part of your lifestyle. Uh, on the way to church this morning, I was listening to Vanilla Ice getting ready for the service today. Remember that song? Stop. Take a look and listen. I got got a new rendition. Mm. That's out. You know it. You know it. Dum -da -dum -da -da -dum -dum. Stop. Collaborate and listen. So that's that's what the Holy Spirit is inviting you to do. Is stop. Stop what stop what you're doing. Listen to Him, and then collaborate with Him to see what He wants to do. So the question is always, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do right now? In the first service this morning, the Lord had me point out a man, asked me if he had pain in his feet. He said, yes, yeah, stand up on your feet, pray for him, God healed his feet. Had somebody heal in their shoulder uh, this, yeah, this one, shoulder this morning. It was cool. Had two people healed of blood disease this morning in the first service. And so how many know you just stop, listen, stop looking, listen, see what the Lord wants to do. Because he's always wanting to do something good for somebody. Amen. So this is what just came up in my heart right now. I just see a dark cloud of oppression that has its root in worry and anxiety. <clears throat> and it's not something that you've tried to medicate it. You've tried uh, all these things, but you just need to, to be delivered. And I'm not saying you got a devil. I'm just saying that the devil doesn't like you. And he's trying to oppress you to keep you from being the person that he's called you to be because he fears you. So if, if that's you this morning, just stand up. Stand up right where you are in your seat. Uh, come on, come on, stand up. And let's get rid of that. Yeah. Would you just stretch your hands out towards these that have raised, that have stood up this morning? Come on, just stretch your hands of faith and love out towards these. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
We take authority over that dark cloud of oppression that has come against these precious ones, and we command it to go, to leave, to dissipate right now. And I, I know this sounds weird, but I just had this song rise up on the inside of me. It says, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. All right, so the rain is gone, the cloud is gone. We command that cloud to go. We just say that the wind of God blows that thing away, disperses it, dissipates it, and the sun is shining bright on your life right now. And what medication couldn't do, the Holy Spirit, the miracle worker's doing right now, we call it done. We call it, we, we cancel the enemy's assignment. You know, heard of cancel culture. We cancel the devil's assignment against you this morning in Jesus' name, in the name of Yeshua. Come on, shout right now, I receive it. Amen. Uh, those of you watching online, some of you need this right now. We just put our faith with yours and we say you are not going to be free. You are free right now. We come against that which has come against you and greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So you are now loosed from your infirmity in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, we just lift both hands this morning and just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, uh, somebody, you have pain in your ankle, <clears throat> maybe even pins that have <clears throat> had to put your ankle back together. There's something in, in, in uh, one of your uh, feet, pins, uh, reconstruction, something was broken and it had to be put back together. Is that somebody? That's you too? Will you just stand up right where you are? Is there somebody else that has that? Maybe somebody online? You just write it down in the comments. All right, all right, all right. Sister, will you just put your hand on her shoulder for me right there? Hold her hand. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your healing power, reconstructing and perfecting. We thank you what the surgeons did, but we thank you that you are the master, master physician. And we speak to those pins, and we command them to dissolve, disappear, and for those bones and ligaments to regrow and to be restored to its perfect original condition. Has there been pain in that ankle? Is it an ongoing pain? What's the, what's the level right now, 1 to 10? About an 8. In Jesus' name, we command, Jesus, you bore our pain. So we thank you, Father, for your healing. The balm of Gilead, the healing virtue of Christ flowing into that ankle right now, doing what only you can do. And we thank you that you paid the price for it. So we receive it today by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. How's the pain level now? But if it was an eight, what is it now? You can't feel it. That sounds like a zero or a one. Look at that scar. Wow. Amen. The scar will just always remind you that what Jesus did for you. Amen. That's all she said. Okay. Amen. Awesome. Praise God. Woo. She don't want to sit down. She, she might start dancing on that new ankle, man. That's awesome. God is good. God is good. God is good. Amen. Man, we're just so grateful that we serve the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, that nothing is too hard for Him. Nothing, nothing is too hard for Him. I can't, you know, one time I prayed for a little boy who had his finger uh, jerked off, and uh, God grew his little finger back. That was awesome, fingernail and everything. I can't wait till God starts growing out arms and legs, and, and how many people that have had uh, uh, sex changes, how many of God can grow anything back? Amen. We're in the last days. And so people start repenting of their sins and wanting to be restored. God's like, I got a miracle for you, man. So nothing is too hard for God. We need to start expecting the outrageous because we serve an outrageously good God. And He loves you more than you think He does. And however good you think He is, He's better than that. He's a good, good God. Amen. I just want to remind you today, He's not mad at you. He poured out all of His wrath on Jesus so He could pour out all of His goodness on you. So I want you to walk out of here today with your head held high, your heart full of joy, and you just confidence of knowing that Jesus is your pattern. Amen. Will you stand up today? Just let me speak a blessing over you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these, your people. They all look like Jesus to me. I pray that you will direct their steps, fill their hearts with your spirit to the overflow. Give them wisdom beyond all of their competitors. And I pray that everything they put their hand to will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today is Pastor Mike Moore's birthday. So we got some cupcakes out in the hallway. So be sure and wish him a happy birthday. Let's go celebrate. If you're a guest with us, 
Come see us over in the guest center or the welcome center. And don't forget to drop your offerings in the giving kiosk. And we'll see you Wednesday night at prayer. We love you. Have a great rest of your Sunday.